evening. Amen. Amen. Grateful to God that you're here in this uh, fourth night of our Bible conference, and um, in a minute we're going to we're going inter to introduce our speaker, and we're going to pray, and uh, we're going to hear the Word of God. And I don't know if you have been like like I've been uh, this day, but during this day I've continued to ask myself, "How's the Lord pruning me?" After hearing those words last night from Lance. Um, throughout this day, I've just I've repeated that, that question in my mind. Lord, how are you pruning me so that I can bear more fruit for you? And we don't have to wrap up every, every thought of, of the, the men that have preached, but, but um, how can we have a heart for missions? How can we be involved in evangelism? But I know this, if the Lord, if we'll let the Lord prune us, we'll be in tune with doing those things. And so I'm glad you're here tonight in this fourth night of our Bible conference to, to think about the Word of God and, and to hear from Tommy Green. A couple of things I, I appreciate about Tommy Green, and you'll appreciate him. Uh, number one, he's from Alabama. <laughs> Amen, right? Roll Tide? All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, Tommy is the 10th uh, Executive Director of the Florida Baptist Convention. He's leading our convention leading this great work that goes on in this state. And uh, this is a busy state, lots of churches, lots of mission work, lots of church planning. And of course, he's overseeing that and, and leading our convention in a great way. Uh, holds a doctorate of theology and a master's of divinity from New Orleans Baptist Theological Sem Seminary, undergraduate from Sanford in, in Birmingham. So Brooks and I, of course, are, uh, have great allegiance to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. We, we're grateful to have a graduate there tonight here with us. And so we're going to pray, and then Tommy's going to come and he's going to preach the word, and that's what we're here for. We're here to engage the scriptures. We're here to be changed by the word, and as we prayed as we did Sunday night, that we may, may walk out after this week and say our souls are different than they were when we came in, because we've engaged the scriptures. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the worship that we've had together. We thank you for truth of the gospel that has been shared this week. We thank you for the topics that have been addressed. It's been your providence that these topics were addressed. Lord, I pray you would grow our church and the churches that are represented here to be on mission for you. That you would grow us to share the gospel of Jesus with the people around us. Our neighbors, our co-workers, our family members. And Father, you would, you would shape us. Man, I just, Lord, I pray those words reverberate in our minds about how you prune us so we can bear fruit. And Father, I, I pray for Tommy tonight as he comes and he opens up the word and he preaches the truth to those here tonight. And it will shape our church. It will grow our church. It will, it will change and help the churches that are represented here. We thank you for your faithfulness in the lives of these men that have come and, and shared with us. And we pray tonight that you will uh, use the word and the power of the spirit to help us become who you desire for us to be. And we pray all of this in the powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Pastor Chris, and what a privilege it is to be here with you at First Baptist Chief. And uh, you're very blessed to have uh, Pastor Chris Mullis here leading you. And uh, I always believe it's important to give honor to whom honor is due in the Lord. And uh, I'm just so thankful for his leadership and for his kingdom heart. And you just join me in just expressing thanks to God for Pastor Chris, his family, and their leadership here at First Baptist Chief. <laughs> Great uh, seeing Luther Beecham here tonight. Luther and I, uh, through the years here in the state, have been involved in probably more stuff than we'll talk about at times in regards to uh, land and churches and acquiring things and doing things through our state board. And we're just so thankful Luther has made a huge impact on the life of Florida Baptist and his handprints all over the state, I assure you. And uh, we're still blessed today uh, with many of the things he did as he served as the council uh, for the uh, Florida Baptist Convention. So Luther, thank you. We love you. And Craig, Miss Vera, as you were sharing with uh, her, her eye issues this time. And over here, Brooks and Jessica, uh, they're like 
kids, our kids in many ways. Uh, uh, Jessica's father and I are best friends. We met in 1977 at college, and God just linked our lives together. And to this day, we still serve uh, together in ministry, and we love this family so dearly. And then uh, she married Brooks, and we just accept him because of Jessica. I mean, you know, <laughs> but, uh, we love Brooks to death and grateful. Brooks served as an intern for us for a while. Uh, while we were at First Baptist Brandon and part of our team there. And so uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joy to be with you here tonight. And tonight as we continue with the different focuses that uh, the pastor had on his heart for, for this time, we want to talk about fellowship and the power that comes when we fellowship together uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I ask you to open the scriptures tonight to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 4. I'm going to read one verse, verse 31. Acts chapter 4, verse 31, and if you're able, I would invite you to stand in honor of God's precious word. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Father, we pray that we'll hear what the Spirit is saying in our lives tonight. Lord, may we glean from the early church what it meant to have fellowship, to be together. Lord, we are grateful for the testimony of your word tonight. And may it accomplish exactly what you desire for it to accomplish in each of our hearts. If there are any here tonight who do not know you as Lord and Savior, we pray tonight will be the time of salvation within their life. For believers who are here, Lord, as Pastor shared a few moments ago, just that pruning process. Help us to continue, Lord, just to allow the Spirit of God to convict us and to challenge us to be everything that we can be. And as we come together in fellowship, Lord, may all that we do be together for your glory and for your honor alone. And we ask and pray this in the high and holy name above all, that of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. When I was in seminary, I had the privilege of serving a church in Pascagoula, Mississippi. It was a little uh, kind of a rural type of church, and uh, the community was one that did not have a lot of people that ever moved into it, uh, but a lot of people moved out of it. And so we were always kind of in a, a state of trying to figure out the future and figure out what we we're going to do because uh, young people were leaving, going to other places to work, just all those kind of things. And so, so uh, when, when someone moved into our little community out there of Franklin Creek, uh, it was a big deal. And so I was driving back, commuting back from New Orleans Seminary on a Friday afternoon, and I, I got behind a, a moving truck. And I thought to myself, man, wouldn't it just be wonderful? If that moving truck got off at the Franklin Creek Road exit, man, that would just be exciting. And I'm driving along behind it, and sure enough, puts on his blinker, and he pulls off on that Franklin Creek Road exit. Well, he was either lost or he was going to Franklin Creek, because that's the only thing you do when you got off that exit. And so sure enough, he turned, and he went up into our little community. And there was a house that had been uh, just for sale for a long time in our community, and, and I guess he had purchased the home, and he pulled into there. And so I said, man, I can't wait till in the morning. I'm going to come by and meet this family and try to encourage them any way that I can. I mean, what a, what a wonderful time for, for an opportunity for the gospel, an opportunity for our church. And so Saturday morning came, and I went to visit him. Uh, found out his story. He you know, was a widower. His wife had passed away uh, earlier that, that, that year. Uh, he, his family lived in different places. We talked about his faith. He was a, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a member of a local church, but he just said, after my wife died, I felt like I just needed a fresh start in a new place, and I found this home. We bought it, and I'm, and I'm here. I said, man, we are so glad you're here. And I, I told him about the church, and I said, man, you know, we'd love you to come be a part of our service tomorrow morning. And I said, yeah, I gave it the time. He said, I'll be there. Well, I've been told that a lot, as probably a lot of you have <laughs> at different times, so you never know if they're actually going to show up or not. So Sunday morning came, and he was there. I mean, it was like, man, this is awesome, you know. But I had no idea the firestorm that I had just set off in that church because he was the first black man who had ever walked into the doors of that church. So we finished the service. Got home, barely had even sat down to eat, and my phone was ringing. And I was invited to a deacon's meeting that afternoon because we needed to discuss the situation that happened at the church this morning. And I'm like, situation? What are y'all talking about? So I get there, and um, one of the deacons uh, expressed some concern about the visitor that we had this morning. And I'm just like, I can't believe this is actually happening. Uh, you know, if that man isn't welcome, we're not welcome. 
And, uh, and so, so um, Archie Hamilton, who worked for the International Paper Company, he was a, a kind of a tall guy. He stood probably about 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, he was quiet, didn't say a whole lot, but, but he was a very spiritual man. And Archie Hamilton stood up in that deacon's meeting. And when I say a deacon's meeting, it was just about four of us in the room. It wasn't like a huge group of deacons. It was about three or four of us. And, uh, and this is what he said. He said, I'm embarrassed and I'm ashamed that we're here this afternoon. He said, our pastor went out yesterday visiting our community and met a man, invited him to come, and he was here this morning. We ought to be celebrating the fact that we're reaching our community, and that people are coming here. <coughs> and he said, now, I don't know really what prompted this today. He said, but I want to tell you, we'll never have this meeting again. He said, because that man will be in church again next Sunday because I'm going by and picking him up. And he's going to sit right beside me. And if any of y'all have a problem with that, don't y'all say a word to our pastor. You come and talk to me. He said, let's pray. He prayed, we left, and that man came, joined our church, and it changed the heart of the congregation. It changed the fellowship that we had together in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Mr. Hamilton made a comment at the end of his statements, and this is what he said. He said, the gospel of Jesus Christ brings us together. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful statement? But it's entirely biblical. The gospel of Jesus Christ brings us together. And the early church in these incipient stages understood the importance of being together. You see, fellowship has always been a benchmark of the church. There's never been a time that they didn't come together. They came together. They gathered in order to disperse. They came together to be edified and equipped. They came together to be prepared and challenged to go out and do the great work that the Lord had commanded us to do, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost. Even in the scriptures it says not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so it's very important. That we understand what fellowship does. The word that is used here for gathering together carries both the physical and spiritual fellowship that we have in Christ Jesus. We need each other. We, we, need, we, we, we need to have iron sharpening iron. We're always better together. But even when we gather together in a physical place, it does not guarantee, nor does it grant entitlement to the spiritual power and presence of God. And I can validate that because look all across our nation, look all across our country at churches that are emptying, at churches that, that meet, but yet they're, 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 there's something that, that is lacking within those churches. And we find that, that the vast majority of Southern Baptist churches are plateaued and declining. As a matter of fact, there are 900 Southern Baptist churches that close their doors every year. 900. Southern Baptist churches. At the same time, there are thousands of ministers leaving the ministry every month across denominational lines. So just because we come to a place doesn't mean that we are in fellowship. Just because we come to a place doesn't mean that we are together in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will miss what God is doing in and through his church if we, not, if we do not expectantly gather with great anticipation where God has called us to be and where God has connected our lives together in the Lord Jesus Christ. And God can do more in a moment when we are in fellowship with him than we can do in a lifetime when we come together. The psalmist declares in Psalm 133, Behold, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. What a powerful statement. He said, he said it's like the precious oil of the head running down upon the beard, the beard of Aaron, and then running down off the edge of his garment. It's there we have the anointing of God. It's there that we experience the presence of God. It is there that we come together under the, the word of God. And the early church understood together. And the verse that we have read tonight the beauty of the scripture is the word they, when they had prayed. The place where they were assembled together with Satan, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. No names needed, just Christ and Christ alone. He is sufficient. He is all that we need. And they came together fully yielded and fully surrendered, unified in mission and in ministry. And their fellowship did become that moment that became a movement. 
as the early church went out into the world. They were together. So as we consider fellowship tonight, we must understand that fellowship is more than, than sitting around a table and having a meal. You know, you know, fellowship is more than just being in the same room with each other. Fellowship is when we come together yielding our hearts, yielding our lives, yielding who we are unto the Lord Jesus Christ and praying that God who has set us in this place together, that God would so solidify and God would so unify our hearts that we would have one heart and one voice and one faith and one Lord and one baptism and that we would move out together believing that God can do great things through his church. And God desires to do great things through his people. So in the scripture, we see that they were together, and they were together in prayer. And when they had prayed. Now the word that is used here for prayer, there are many words that are translated as prayer in the English language from the original language. But this is a word that speaks about urgent prayer and desperate prayer. Pleading before God. Just crying out, outside of you, O oh Lord, there is nothing. And Lord, we need to hear from you. Lord, we desire you. Lord, we're committing to you. And Lord, unless you move, we cannot move. Just an urgent prayer. An urgent desire to experience the Lord. Together, often, we have so many self-inflicted wounds. We are our own worst enemies at times. We, 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 we're consumed with pride rather than prayer with pettiness rather than prayer, with pouting rather than prayer, politics rather than prayer, position rather than prayer. Even the disciples struggled with this. Remember, they went out and they came back very discouraged and very defeated. And they said, Jesus, why could we not do these things? Why could we not accomplish these things? And Jesus said to them in Mark 9, 29, this kind can come out by nothing but through prayer and fasting. And so prayer brings us together. And when they had prayed. Now, I don't know how much you're paying attention to things that are happening on college campuses right now around America. Uh, you may be skeptical about that. I mean, that's, 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 that's your heart, whatever you, you decide. But God's doing something. Amen. And they're coming together and they're praying. And, and then sometimes we, we don't want to believe and accept it because why would he do it there and not here? Why, 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 why at Asbury and, and not, not in Chiefland? Why, why at Asbury and not, not in Jacksonville? Why, why at Asbury? I mean, I mean and sometimes we, we forget that God is going to move when people are willing to humble themselves and cry out to him, when people are willing to yield their life to him, when people are willing to confess and repent and be made right before him. When they came together, they were crying out to God. God, you move. Lord, we're not bringing an agenda to you. We're just submitting to you. Fully surrendering our lives to your power and to your presence. Together. Fellowship in prayer. How many of you have ever had someone who just prayed urgently over your life? Someone that just interceded desperately for you. Have you ever been in that place in your life where someone was praying that way for you? I was very blessed to have two very godly grandmothers. One of my grandmothers lived just a, a, a hundred yards or so away from the home that I grew up in as a boy. And my parents both worked out of the home, and so when I would come home, I'd ride the school bus, and they wanted me to stay with my grandmother. And so they would let me off there at my grandmother's house, and I would run up toward her, her door, and I would always stop about the time I'd get to her steps and inhale real good because she cooked these amazing little cookies. Now she called them sugar cookies. I got tea cakes kind of thing. They melt about the time they'd get to right here. I mean, they were just wonderful. And if she had cooked those sugar cookies, she had me do anything she needed to be done. So I'd go inside and she would say, you have any homework? I'd say, yes, ma'am, I do. Get it done. I can smell those cookies. I'm the best homework doer in America. I want to tell you, I can knock it out just like that. And then she would take those cookies. I mean, and she, she's pretty strategic with this. She'd take those cookies on a plate, and she'd put them down on, on the little uh, coffee table there, and we would sit on the couch. I mean, I can remember this. I mean, I'm talking about when I'm in the second, third, fourth grade, going to her house as a child, fifth grade, and she would set those cookies down on that table, and then we would sit on her couch. And I remember my grandmother had plastic over her couch. <laughs> I, I never figured that out. I mean, just, you know, you just kind of... 
sweaty and hot and stick to it. And y'all, okay, y'all know what I'm talking about, okay? And so, so, so we'd sit down there, cookies in front. I've done my homework, and I'd get to the cookie. And, and, and but she'd say, before we're going to do any of that, she'd open up the Bible. And she'd start reading scripture to me. She'd just read verses. I mean, I, you know, I'm listening. I, I, I mean, I wasn't particularly that interested. I'm just listening. But man, she knew what she was doing. She was hiding the word of God in my heart. She was planting seeds that would bear great fruit over my life. And I can still see her little hands. She'd lift them up and she'd put them on my shoulders. And she'd start praying for me. And she'd cry out to God for me. I always thought, you know, I felt uncomfortable almost, really. Just, just her, her just having that, 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 that burning zeal in her heart to pray. And I can remember phrases she would say like that, that I would come to know Christ as my Savior. That I would, I would grow up and be a man that God would use and that God would protect me. I mean, she just prayed these beautiful prayers over my life. And this is just year after year after year after year in the afternoons. Now, my other grandmother... She was a little bit different. She was a happy prayer. She would sing, and she would shout, and she'd pray, and everyone she'd do it, really. And uh, I'd go into her house, and she, she, she had this big chair, had these, these overstuffed arms. She'd say, oh, honey, sit right here. So I'd hop up there. You think, I'm an awful kid because everybody prayed over me. I don't know, but, 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 I, but I would sit there, and, and, and she'd start singing. And, oh, she'd just be singing to Jesus, and then she, she, she'd start quoting Scripture. And then, hand me my Bible. I'd hand her the Bible, and she'd start you know, reading from the Bible. And then she'd say, I'm going to pray, and she'd start praying. And, and, and when this grandmother prayed, she, she grabbed hold of your cheeks, <laughs> and she pulled your face to hers. And, and I don't, you know, y'all have done that. You know what I'm talking about. She just pulled right in there, and she's about right here praying. Now, why that's kind of significant is this. This grandmother dipped snuff. <laughs> and your grandma dipped snuff? Raise your hand. Y'all be embarrassed. They did it. I mean, you know. And I, I remember mean, I saying, you know, say it and don't spray it. I mean, that's what I thought. Like. <laughs> she's praying over me. But man, my life has just been covered in prayer. And, and, and I know that every day of my life, even though both of them have long gone home to the Lord, every day of my life, God is answering those prayers. Together in prayer. Together in prayer. We also see in this early church that they were together in presence. Notice the very next phrase, the place. Here they are. Now, they're not in a fancy building like this. They're, they're, they're in a home. It's, it's, like a, it's like a house church. And they would come together. And here they were in the place where they were assembled together with shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And that gives us a little bit of more insight into prayer, doesn't it? I mean, they, they came in before anybody spoke, before anybody sang, before anybody gave announcements, before anybody did anything. They prayed because they knew that if God wasn't in their midst, that nothing was going to happen. They, they knew that without the moving of God over their lives, there would just simply be a gathering of people and so when they came together, they prayed. But yet, as they prayed, they were together in presence, the presence of the Lord, in the presence of one another. And there was a shaking, and there was a filling that occurred as they prayed. Now, I don't know about you, but I like the filling part. You know, Lord, fill me up. Lord, use me. Lord, take me. Lord, you know, do all these things through my life. And we all like that filling side of it. You know, where we think we're being obedient, and we, we're being used of God to do things. But none of us really like the shaking part. We don't like that part. Because that's what we were talking about a few moments ago. The pruning. God breaking things off our life. God revealing things to us individually and even corporately. Things that are not pleasing to him. Things that do not honor him. But isn't that the heart of what revival is all about? Being shaken to be filled. Shaken, it means to be unsettled. It means to be stirred in your spirit. To be afflicted. It's just conviction of God that comes through prayer by his Holy Spirit upon our lives. 
breaking things off of our life, the work of the Holy Spirit. I mean, what is God seeking to shake off your life? What needs to be broken off your life even tonight? Because sin always has a cost. It has a cost in my life. It has a cost in your life. It has a cost in our life as we come together. And yet we know that the price of sin was paid in full on the cross of Calvary by Jesus Christ, Amen. our Lord. Amen. And as we come before him, as he shakes us, he is doing that because he loves us. He chastens those whom he loves. And as he shakes us, we need to be responsive, repentant. We need to cry out for mercy, for forgiveness, to turn away from those things unto what God would call us to be as fully devoted followers of him. Well, sin is real. It has a face. It has a taste. It has a place in all of our lives. And yet when we come together and we desperately cry out to God, he shakes us. He shakes us. He shakes us in order to fill us. <laughs> unhindered fellowship with Christ. Now, I know with Baptists, you know, we get a little nervous. We start talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, you know, we, we just, we, 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 we believe in all that, but we don't quite know how to talk about it. We don't even quite know what to do about it most of the time. You know, we're nervous about the Holy Spirit and worship. You know, we don't know if we can lift our hands this high, this high, that high, go full on touchdown. I mean, I mean, we, we just don't know sometimes, you know. And if somebody does, I mean, we look at them, they're like, oh, I didn't mean to do that, you know. I mean, you know, we just enjoy the Lord for the Spirit of God moves over our lives. But yet we do understand this, that the moment that you accept Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and as your Savior. The moment that you repent of your sins, you confess your sins, you turn from sin and self unto the Lord Jesus Christ, you call upon his great and mighty name and you confess him as your Lord and Savior, you surrender your life to him. At that moment, you are saved and you are saved eternally. You are saved to the uttermost. You receive eternal life at the moment that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Some people think I get eternal life and I go to heaven. No. You get eternal life when you're saved because you are saved to the uttermost in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Amen. Savior. Amen. But we fully understand, though, that we can quench the Spirit of God. I'm fully aware that I can hinder the Spirit of God in my own life. That I can be a barrier to God moving, not only in my life, but in the life of of the fellowship. And so as they were shaken, they were filled. Not what someone else needs to do, but Lord, what must I do? Understanding Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Lord, I have walked past sin and with a curiosity. I, I have stood and observed it. And Lord, there have been times I've just sat right in the middle of it. And I know, Lord, that I am not what I ought to be as a believer in you, O oh Lord. And I'm thankful that you are the great deliverer. And so, Lord, shake me that you might fill me to be fit to be used for your kingdom's glory. And fellowship is important. Our fellowship in Christ and our fellowship with one another. Because spiritual warfare is imminent. It's not imaginary. It's imminent. And Satan is like a mighty lion seeking whom he may devour. He is a wolf in sheep clothing. But greater is he that is in you, greater is he that is among us than he that is in the world. So as we come together, we come together that his presence can move. We come putting our agendas at the door. We come putting our wants and our wishes to the side. And we just humble ourselves and we say, Lord, shake us. Lord, shake me. Lord, move in my life. Lord, I know I can point out everybody else's wrongs and everybody else's sins, but Lord, I need to work that only you can do in my life. And Lord, I come, I desire to be shaken, that I can be filled by your Holy Spirit to be able to be used of you in the work that you have for us to do together as a result of our fellowship in the Lord Jesus Christ. They were together. They were also together in purpose. I love this last part. And they, again, no names, just they, they spoke the word of God with
know, sometimes, well, I, I can't, I don't know, I'm not, I can't do that, I can't serve, I can't witness, I can't do that. And oftentimes it's not that we can't, but it's that we have not put ourselves in a position that we can. We've got to be found fit before God, faithful before Him. And he enables us to speak the word. His Spirit calls us. His Spirit empowers us to speak the word of God with boldness. Boldness through prayer. Boldness through the moving of the Holy Spirit. And what you find about this early church is so evident throughout the book of Acts. They were together. They were together. They were unified. There was fellowship that they shared. They bore one another's burdens. They gave as others had need. They were willing to sacrifice for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was out <coughs> walking down a sidewalk. And as I was walking down the sidewalk, and there was, I just something caught my eye. And I'm like, what in the world is this? And, and, and there was this little cheetah, not, not a cheetah, a cheese nip. You know, those little square cheese nips, you know, that, that you have. And it was just moving down the sidewalk. <laughs> and I'm like, what in the world is going on here? And as I got closer, this is what I saw. Can you run that video real quick? <laughs> Look at these ants. You got a couple of them wanting to join the party here. What's this? They finally get in the grave. And together, they're moving a cheetah down the sidewalk. And they're doing it together. They're doing it together. That's a beautiful picture of what we need to do as a family of God. Amen. We can't all lift the load, but together we can. There's not one of us that can do it all, but together, God can do a lot through our lives. Amen. And it doesn't matter who is at the front. I mean, that, they, that Cheeto just spinning around. They just get wherever they could in there to be a, to help, be a part of it. Sometimes I'll be a part of it if I can be the leader. I'll be a part of it if my, you know, I mean, we, we get that ego in the midst of that when he's just saying, man, be together for the purpose of God. Just surrender yourself. Surrender the church to the great commission that God has given to us. For if we do not believe that in Christ we can change the world from where we are, then in Christ we will not change the world that God has put us in. We've got to be faithful where we are, not consumed by how many we are seating, but by how many we are sending. What God is doing together to move us out to do his great, glorious kingdom's work. In Chiefland, in Levy County, in Central Florida, in Florida, across North America, and to the nations, all to his glory, not to ours. And it takes every one of us getting around that Cheeto <laughs> and doing our part. Doing our part. It was interesting going through the, all the things these past few years, particularly the pandemic, and <clears throat> what all we went through in the church, and you know, trying to find ways to minister when people were you know, quarantined and things of that nature. But coming out of it, it's made it even more interesting. Because there were some things that kind of rolled off the table during that. But there also were things where we're sitting around, as I go to many, many churches, sitting around waiting for some Sunday when everything's going to be the way it was. You know, we're just waiting. They're going to come back. Did they come back yet? No. We're just waiting. They're going to come back. You know, it's been like two years. You know, they may not be coming back, you know. But, but you can't just stay. You can't get stuck. You can't just wait. God's got a ministry out there for us. God has a great work for us to be doing. And so, so as, as I've seen the life of churches, and I, I, think, I think there are two categories that churches find, find themselves in. One is called a placeholder, and the other is a stakeholder. A placeholder or a stakeholder. Placeholders are inward focus, but stakeholders are outward focus. Placeholders become consumed with budgets and buildings, but, but, but stakeholders are consumed with mission and ministry. Placeholders are trying to escape the culture, but stakeholders are engaging the culture. Placeholders grumbling and griping, 
Stakeholders are gaining and growing. Placeholders are giving up and giving out, but stakeholders are, are giving more and giving all. We find that placeholders are stuck, but stakeholders are unstuck. Placeholder churches are defending the status quo, but stakeholder churches are rising up together in fellowship, and they are declaring, let's go. Let's do all that we can do, because we want to be faithful in our generation, to be all that God has called us and prepared us to be. Oh, this group of they... They did. Because if you look at Acts 4.31 and move forward to Acts 17, verse 6 at a later time, in Acts 17, 6, it says, those who have turned the world upside down, they have come here also. Now, Acts is basically one generation. It's a 30-year span of time that literally changed the world. So, so who is this those who have turned the world upside down? It's they out of Acts 4.31. We just came together and said, Lord, we believe what you want us to do. And we're going to commit ourselves to that. And they boldly took the word of God to the world. Oh, it was costly to them. They lost businesses. They <laughs> lost income. They were beaten. They were imprisoned. <coughs> Many were put to death in martyrdom, but they turned the world upside down. And I don't think there was a moment of regret because they were together in Christ. They, they, they spoke the word of God with boldness. They, they lived out their faith, maligned, misunderstood, ostracized, outcast. They were called Christians. Those Christ people, those Christ followers, because they had an unrelenting commitment to Christ. But they're just a group of they. No names, nothing that seems to stand out. Just they, whom God used to change the world. God has brought us together in Florida. And God has brought the world to Florida. There are 21 million people in our state from June of 2021 to June of 2022 the U.S. Census Bureau reveals that there are 318,000 people who moved into the state of Florida one year I passed by a lot of them at the RV parks <laughs> <laughs> seem to have taken over cheap one all of a sudden Amen so they're, they're, God has brought the nations to us. The people are all, all, all around us. If, if, you, if you break down the generations that are found in Florida, there are 4 million people who are college age and younger in our state. You realize we have 1 million students on college campuses in Florida today? 1 million that are going to go all over the world doing the occupations and skills that they have. Well, we've got to reach that next generation for Christ. And who wants that next generation? Who wants the next generation? Who's willing to commit to the next generation to reach them for Christ? And then you take 65 and up. That's my demographic. There are 5 million people in Florida who are age 65 and above. 4 million, college down. 5 million, 65 and above. There's about 12 to 13 million sandwiched in between. And God is bringing people to every community, every city in the state of Florida. And we're not together in fellowship to see what God desires to do in and through his people in a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-generational way. Then we're going to miss out on one of the greatest moments in history for the church. In the state of Florida to make a difference in the world that God has planted us within. This Florida Baptist family that we're part of, it's, it's a beautiful tapestry of people. Sunday morning, listen to this. There were Hispanic, Haitian, Brazilian, Asian American, African American, Anglo, multi-ethnic, Caribbean, American Indian, Arabic, Asian Indian, Cambodian, Chinese. These are all Florida Baptist Church, Chinese, deaf, 
Pakistani, Caribbean, Ethiopian, Filipino, Hungarian, Japanese, Jewish, Korean, Romanian, Russian, Slavic, Thai, Ukrainian, Russian, Ukrainian churches. They, they worship together here. They fight over there. They worship together here. Vietnamese, Zomi Burnese, Bhutanese, Nepali, Portuguese. This, this is who we are as a Florida Baptist family. And we've got to be together. Our fellowship is so important. We've got to surrender anything of who we are to who he is and say, Lord Jesus, in this day, in this time, in this moment, may we be found faithful to you because you have given us one of the greatest mission fields in the world to make a difference in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I ask you, can we come together tonight? Tonight. Why not tonight? Why not right now? Can, 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 we, can, we, can we join at an altar to launch a movement? To come to the altar and be together in prayer? To come together and pray for others? To pray with others? To pray for others? Can, can we come together in prayer and just cry out desperately and urgently? So often our prayers are very perfunctory. Lord, bless this. Lord, do this. Lord, use that. Lord, take this. Lord, take that. But can we come together tonight and just cry out, Lord, Lord, do what only you can do in my life. Do what only you can do in our life. Do what only you can do through your church, Lord. And we humble ourselves before you and we cry out in desperation. Oh, Lord. Lord, I confess. I repent. Lord, I commit. Lord, I know there's been missed opportunities. I don't want to miss any more. I don't want to pass by any more, Lord, what you desire to do. I want every day, every moment of my life to count for you, Lord. And I cry out in tonight to you in prayer. We cry out in tonight. Maybe you have a hard time coming and kneeling. These seats are empty. We're Baptists. Nobody's at the front. So you can just come and sit here. That's fine. You can come and stand, but can we come together in prayer? Maybe you come tonight praying for a son and a daughter, a husband, a wife, a brother, a sister who's far away from the Lord. Come crying out desperately for them tonight that they would come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Can we come together tonight in prayer and say, Lord, we're so thankful for the rich and wonderful heritage and history of everything that you've done at First Baptist Chiefland. And Lord, you've got us in such a great moment right now. Lord, help us, Lord, to be so together in whatever you want us to do as we go forward, Lord, that we will just make a difference that we've never made before in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can we lay aside everything that that hinders us tonight. We come together. Shake us, Lord. Fill us, Lord. That we would be bold to turn the world upside down. Just a group of they turning the world upside down. All to the Lord's honor and glory. On oh, the gospel, it demands everything of my life and everything of your life. Because Jesus, he paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin, it had left a crimson stain. But Jesus paid in full, went to a cross, the just for the unjust, and died in our place, that through him we can be saved. So, Lord, I come tonight committing all that I am to you. Lord, you would help me to be bold, believing that we can change Chiefland. We can change Levy County. We can change Florida. We can change the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we commit our lives to you tonight. That's what fellowship does. That's what fellowship does. It brings us as one to be people. God has called us and saved us to be. We're going to stand in a moment, and uh, as we have our invitation, this altar is open, side to side to come to pray tonight. Maybe you're not even a member of this church, but you just feel we have to come and pray tonight. Remember another church, come and pray tonight. We, we just want to cry out unto the Lord. Maybe there's some here tonight who never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. 
And I pray that you'll not leave this place tonight without giving your life to Christ. Coming. Just surrendering yourself to him. Calling out to his great and mighty name. Believing in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that whosoever will call on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. We must confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Christ from the dead, and we shall be saved. So tonight, you can experience that salvation, a miracle, a miracle that God will do in your life. Come, giving yourself to him. Maybe tonight, you just want to come and say, Lord, I've kind of stepped to the side a little bit. I'm just not where I used to be. I'm not as committed as I used to be. My life's so busy with stuff right now, I can just barely make it to church. But man, I realize that's an emptiness that's in my life. I need fellowship. I need to be together with God's people. I need what God does through his church and through his people. I yearn for that, Lord. And I commit my life tonight to be faithful to you. Pastor will be here at the altar. Any way that he can minister to you, he'd be more than thrilled to talk with you, the staff here. And uh, we just encourage you, this altar is open, that we would come, just as we <clears> see <throat> in the early church. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Let's stand with every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we pray now for these next moments. Lord, we ask that. We would be found faithful to you. Lord, we respond only because your Holy Spirit calls us to. Lord, we know that where your Spirit moves and when your Spirit speaks, then we must be obedient. So, Father, we cry out tonight unto you. We pray that even at this altar, Lord, that we will come interceding for others, praying for the needs in our own life, repentant, humble before you, Lord, crying out desperately. Pray for the decisions that need to be made, decisions of salvation, decisions of commitment, believers who need to repent of things in their life to be to be shaken and filled. Lord, we, we just give this to you, Lord. It's all it's all what you desire. So Lord, may this be a night. A night where, Lord, we will see a fellowship, obedience, together in Christ. And do through your church, through your people. And we pray this in Jesus.